In this presentation, I will briefly discuss the structure function relationship in the epidermal growth factor receptor. Pictured here is a representation of the active EGF bound receptor dimer embedded in the exterior cell membrane. Unless otherwise noted, all of the images and movies in this presentation have been generated by myself using Chimera, a free visualization software package. The epidermal growth factor receptor, or EGFR, is involved in cell growth and differentiation in cells. In other words, mitogenic responses via the tyrosine kinase signaling pathway. In humans, EGFR is referred to as HER1, or in other animals, as HERB-B1. Other members of the EGFR family include HER2, HER3, and HER4. Although structurally related, the other family members have altered functionality. Notably, HER2 has no ability to bind epidermal growth factor, and HER3 cannot act as a kinase. However, by working together, these proteins can successfully carry out the hormone binding and phosphorylation activities necessary for a functioning cell surface receptor. Given that signaling triggers cell growth, it's no surprise that these receptors play a huge role in the development of cancer. In fact, it was the first receptor protein identified as an oncogene, and it's currently a major target for pharmaceutical cancer therapies. EGF itself is a small peptide hormone that can be found throughout the body. It has rigid tertiary structure influenced by three disulfide bonds and two antiparallel beta sheets. We will see later how this structural rigidity influences the way it binds to EGFR. The EGFR family itself is part of the larger family of receptor tyrosine kinases, which also includes the insulin receptors. These proteins all participate in the tyrosine kinase pathway. First, an, an extracellular hormone binds to the receptor on the cell surface, triggering changes that activate the intracellular kinase domain. This kinase domain phosphorylates tyrosine residues on target proteins, resulting in downstream signaling. The distinguishing feature of receptor tyrosine kinases is the single transmembrane helix that joins the receptor module with the kinase domain. And the big question is, how does this single helix transmit information about the binding of hormone outside the cell to the kinase domain inside the cell? How does the kinase domain know that a hormone is bound? The answer is that hormone binding influences dimerization of the receptors, and that dimerization is necessary for the receptor complex to carry out phosphorylation. Once again, we can see the overall structure of an active EGFR dimer. Note that this structure is a composite of three separate solved structures identified by the PDB's IDs listed below. The single transmembrane helix makes crystallographic analysis of the whole protein impossible, and so the structures of the extracellular module, transmembrane helix, and kinase domains have all been solved separately. Each EGFR family monomer is a single 1200 residue peptide, which can dimerize as either a homodimer with another identical receptor protein, or as a heterodimer with other compatible members of the EGFR family. The extracellular module participates symmetrically in dimerization. In contrast, the kinase domains of both monomers asymmetrically dimerize. In other words, one kinase domain acts as the activator, and the other domain acts as a receiver and becomes activated. A normal EGFR receptor by itself has no significant kinase activity, as its kinase domain must be activated by a dimerization partner. Dimerization is influenced by contacts throughout the entire monomer. Between the ECMs, the transmembrane helices, the juxtamembrane latches, and the kinase domains. Here we can see the primary structure of an EGFR monomer. In yellow are the cysteine residues, and we can see the disulfide-rich domains 1 and 4 of the extracellular module. In red, outside the membrane, are many sites of N-glycosylation that play a role in localizing the protein to the cell surface after translation. Also note the red-labeled residues in the C-terminal tail. These are sites of tyrosine autophosphorylation. By trans-autophosphorylation of the C-terminal tail, an active EGFR can recruit SH2 domains and target proteins for further phosphorylation or downstream signaling. 
The EGFR dimerization model proposes that the extracellular module exists in an equilibrium between either tethered or extended conformations. Interactions between domains 2 and 4 stabilize the tethered conformation. When EGF binds at the interface between domains 1 and 3, it stabilizes the extended conformation. All four domains are structurally quite rigid, and so they tend to only deform at the flexible linkers between them. Here's a brief animation showing the plausible transition between tethered and extended conformations. The interaction between domains 2 and 4 in the tethered conformation is stabilized by two key residues. I'm going to zoom in here on asparagine 579 in this region. This part of domain 2 is called the dimerization arm because it plays a major role in the dimerization interface. Here it serves to stabilize the tethered conformation instead. Asparagine 579 here is covalently bonded to glucosamine, and this glycosylation has been found experimentally to be crucial for stabilizing the tethered conformation. Glucosamine can form a hydrogen bond with the amide side chain of asparagine 256 in domain 2. Here we can see the interaction of histidine 565 of domain 4 with the backbone carbonyl of this valine residue. In HER2, this histidine is replaced by a phenylalanine residue. HER2 has lost the ability to bind EGF, so this lack of a stabilizing tethered interaction helps it maintain an extended conformation without ligand binding. EGF binds to the crease between domains 1, and 3 when EGFR is in the extended conformation. By forming strong interactions with do both domains, it stabilizes the extended conformation. The rigid tertiary structures of EGF, as well as domains 1 and 3, influence the stabilization. EGF forms parallel beta sheet like interactions between itself and domain 1. A conserved arginine residue forms a salt bridge that helps link EGF with domain 3. And finally, a leucine residue reaches into a hydrophobic pocket formed by these reg residues on the surface of domain 3. When two extended EGFR monomers dimerize, the primary point of contact is between both domain 2s, specifically at the dimerization arms. Domain 4 contacts are likely important as well, but have not been observed yet in crystallographic studies. The dimerization arm itself forms an interesting hydrophobic interaction with its partner. Hydrophobic molecular surface can be seen in red and hydrophilic in blue. The label residues are on the green ribbon. We can see hydrophobic residues of one arm associated directly with the hydrophobic surfaces on the other. Phenylalanine, glycine, alanine, proline, proline, leucine, methionine, leucine, tyrosine, proline. Next, we'll see how dimerization occurs in the kinase domains. Here we can see a crystal structure of the asymmetric kinase dimer. On the right in yellow is the activator kinase, and the receiver is on the left in blue. Each kinase domain consists of two lobes, the C lobe and the N lobe. The C lobe is bulkier and more rigid than the N lobe and the dimer interface is between the C-lobe of the activator and the N-lobe of the receiver. The kinase active site is located here, in the cleft between the two lobes. Before we look at the active site, I need to briefly describe the proposed catalytic mechanism of tyrosine kinases. ATP is the primary substrate of the kinase. First, ATP binds deep in the active site, and then the tyrosine residue on the target protein performs a base-catalyzed nucleophilic attack. When ATP binds, aspartate-831 
of the kinase coordinates the associated magnesium ion, stabilizing ATP's binding. At the same time, an ion pairing interaction between lysine 721 and glutamate 738 stabilizes the charged side chains so that lysine can hydrogen bond with the alpha phosphate of ATP. Finally, aspartate 813 acts as the catalytic base that deprotonates the substrate tyrosine's hydroxyl group, allowing it to attack the gamma phosphate. Here we can see the kinase domain in the active conformation crystallized with the substrate analog in the active site. The smaller end lobe is here, and the activator kinase would be present just beyond it here. This helix is referred to as helix alpha C, and its positioning is crucial in activating the kinase. Also note the activation loop here, which when the kinase is active, is in an extended position. It helps position the protein substrate for phosphorylation. I'm going to zoom in on the active site here. Here are the alpha, beta, and gamma phosphoryl groups of the ATP molecule. In this active conformation, helix alpha C is positioned close to the active site, with the ion pairing glutamate close to the hydrogen bonding lysine. Also note the magnesium coordinating aspartate is very close to the active site. In the inactive conformation, helix alpha C will move outwards and the magnesium coordinating aspartate will move away from the active site as well. With these two key residues moved away from the active site, ATB binding is much less favorable in this conformation. Here's an animation showing the transition between active and inactive conformations. Pay attention to the activation loop here. In its active conformation, it's extended. However, it's going to contract as the kinase becomes inactivated. Helix alpha C is here. Here's the ion pairing glutamate, the lysine, and the magnesium coordinating aspartate. Helix alpha C moves out and inactive, and to activate it moves closer to the active site here. Now the question is, how does the activator affect this change upon the receiving kinase? The interaction occurs at the broad interface between the dimerase kinase domains. This is an image of the end lobe surface of the receiving kinase in the undimerized inactive conformation. Here's helix alpha C, and the crucial ion pairing glutamate. On the end lobe surface are several hydrophobic amino acid residues in a disorganized conformation. The end lobe of the kinase is pretty malleable, while the C lobe is more rigid. There are a number of hydrophobic residues in the C lobe of the activator that will interact favorably with these hydrophobic residues, pushing helix alpha C inwards and stabilizing the active conformation. Next, I'm going to show the same surface in the activated kinase dimer. Here is helix alpha C in the end lobe of the activated kinase. And here is the C lobe of the activator. You can see the hydrophobic residues of the active C lobe have helped organize the hydrophobic surface of the activated end lobe. This in turn pushes the helix alpha C inwards, helping activate the kinase. There's an interesting series of experiments that illustrate the importance of this hydrophobic surface interaction. Researchers created two mutant populations of EGFRs. In one population, they mutated the hydrophobic residues of the C lobe surface so that they couldn't act as activators. And in the other, they mutated the hydrophobic residues of the end lobe interface so they couldn't be activated. On their own, both populations of mutant receptors were incapable of kinase activity. However, when both populations were mixed together, normal kinase activity was restored, proving that the kinase domain could act either as an activator or a receiver, and that this activity was dependent upon the asymmetric hydrophobic surface interaction between dimerized kinases. Here's a brief animation showing how the end lobe surface reorganizes from the inactive to active conformation. 
Imagine the C lobe of the activator approaching from the top. You can see how this reorganization pushes the helix alpha C inwards. Moving on, I'm going to briefly discuss how the trans and juxtamembrane regions influence dimerization and activation. Here we can see a crystallographic structure of the kinase dimer, including the juxtamembrane A and B regions. Researchers believe that JMB may act as something of a latch that helps hold the kinase domains together. On the right is a proposed structure of the trans and juxtamembrane regions of the EGFR dimer. In white is one EGFR monomer, and in green and purple is the other. The JMA regions form this interesting anti-parallel helix interaction, and the transmembrane helices interact between pairs of glycine residues that I will show in the following slides. Here is a close-up of the anti-parallel helices in the JMA region of an EGFR dimer. We can see hydrophobic residues in the center interacting favorably with each other and lysine residues forming potential hydrogen bonds with carbonyl groups in the peptide backbone. Moving on to the transmembrane helices, we can see how this GXXXG motif influences favorable interaction in the hydrophobic space inside the membrane. In EGFR, there are only two residues between the glycines. However, we can see in this helical wheel diagram how well they line up with each other when both helices are side by side. The lack of a side chain means the two helices can approach very closely in the hydrophobic environment inside the membrane. Here is a close-up view of the helix interaction. Here are the Van der Waals surfaces of the atoms in the helices approaching very closely, and here are the inner atomic distances. The hydrophobic environment inside the membrane allows a strange phenomenon to occur. The alpha carbon atoms of the glycine residues here and here can serve as hydrogen bond donors to the carbonyl oxygens of the backbone, here and here. The alpha carbons are somewhat electron deficient because of the surrounding amide groups, and so they can more easily donate a hydrogen to the electronegative H bond receiver, especially in the hydrophobic environment of the membrane, where the dielectric constant has a lower value than in an aqueous environment. Now we should be able to understand the big picture of how EGFR dimerization influences function. The extracellular module of the EGFR exists in a tethered extended equilibrium before binding EGF stabilizes the extended conformation. The extended conformation makes dimerization of the extracellular modules possible, leading to favorable interactions between the trans and juxtamembrane regions. And most importantly, between kinase domains. In the activated kinase domain, helix alpha C is pushed inwards towards the ATB binding active site, allowing the ion pairing glutamate to interact with the active site lysine and stabilizing the bonding of ATP. This concludes the presentation. Here are my references, and thank you for watching.